Welcome to Abbotsford. This glorious house was fashioned by Sir Walter Scott on the banks of the River Tweed near Melrose, here in the Scottish borders. Now, Scott had not one, but two hugely successful literary careers. Firstly, he was a much praised poet. Remember this, breeze there the man with soul so dead, who never to himself hath said, this is my own, my native land. Not content with that, he then wrote the Waverley novels, mostly historical fiction. They are astounding in their scope, their scale, and their insight. We're nearing the 250th anniversary of Sir Walter Scott's birth, so join me for this special presentation. For the highlight, we'll illuminate Smalham Tower, next to the Borders Farm where Sir Walter stayed as a boy. All part of prolonged celebrations of Sir Walter Scott across Scotland. So join me inside Abbotsford. This is Abbotsford's entrance hall. Now glance around and you could plainly see that Sir Walter was fascinated by Scottish history. He was immersed in antiquity. But you know, to read his great works, his great poems, his great novels, is no dusty antiquarian exercise. To me, they are as fresh and invigorating as ever. Remember too, that when he was first published, his works were devoured by readers around the world. He was a Scottish, literary star, and to me, he still is. This is Sir Walter Scott's study. Here he wrote his later novels, and at this desk, this very desk, previously in another room, he wrote his greatest works. There's history here, all around us, but sadness too. In 1826, following a financial crash, Sir Walter fell deeply in debt. He promised to repay his creditors, and he did so by working ceaselessly, tirelessly, by writing. In this very room, at this very desk, the debt was repaid shortly after he died. Perhaps we can hear in the atmosphere around us Sir Walter's own promise. I will involve no friend, either rich or poor, my own right hand shall do it. But perhaps we can hear other voices in this room too. Scott hugely admired Jane Austen's work and, and she wrote in mock indignation to her niece that Sir Walter Scott was already a successful poet and had no business to write novels, especially good ones. Or do we hear an echo of Lord Byron? Scott and Byron corresponded enthusiastically and Byron wrote of Scott in his diary, wonderful man, I long to get drunk with him. This is the library here at Abbotsford. I'm delighted to be joined by Kirsty Archer Thompson, the curator at Abbotsford. Now we're celebrating the 250th anniversary of Sir Walter's birth. To be, to be blunt, uh, why in artistic and literary terms is he worth commemorating? You raise a really good point here, Brian, because we don't now just look back and commemorate these famous heavyweights of the past without interrogating that central question. What do they mean to us today? Why does it matter? And I think more so in the last decades of, of debate than ever before mm. when we're thinking about um, these famous names. With Scott, I think it's his richness and his complexity. This was a man that wasn't just um, a literary superstar, but had this legacy across spheres from mm. architecture to art and design, mm. landscape management, just the, the cultural icons of Scotland itself, the symbolism of, of a nation, identity, belonging, well-being. We could go on and on and on. I can't think of uh, another writer in the last 200, 250 years that's left behind such an astonishing footprint. If we think about the, the journal and these thousands of letters that he's left to us, we can get under the skin of a living, breathing man from the past. He can be understood in a three-dimensional, technical way, and that's what we want to do this year. And things like uh, elements like the journal and the letters, they're incredibly poignant, they're incredibly personal, and yet for, for many, Sir Walter is still 
a hard sell. They see him as slightly cold, as 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 being archaic, as 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 being very much in in the past, rather than having contemporary relevance. You you don't, of course, see it that way. No, but that that is the challenge of a nineteenth century writer. You know, the 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 style of prose that we all enjoy, or many popularly enjoy, has changed. And, you know, Scott was very much a product of his time. But there's a lot of humour in Scott. Mm. There's a lot of nuance and complexity there. And don't be put off by the Scots dialect sections. You know, take, take the time. Hear it out Trust loud me, in I your won't. head. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, uh, you're perhaps, I'm preaching to the choir here, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. But he is just astonishingly rich. And there are many different ways of seeing particular yeah. excerpts and passages from his novels. That's what's so special about Scott. He's a Scots patriot. But again, some think it slightly bogus. It's an interesting one because you quite often get this polarisation between mm. Scott and Burns, that Burns was oh, the man yes. of the Scottish people and, and Scott was somehow not. But I think actually, um, you know, Scott has done more for our sense of identity and mm. of safeguarding that than perhaps any other writer. Thank you very much. Now let's hear from some experts on Sir Walter Scott's life, work, and influences, starting with my good friend and colleague, Kirsty Wark, who's immersed in Scotland's culture. Thank you very much, Brian. I am so jealous of you being at Abbotsford. As a child, uh, Walter Scott's novels were in uh, my grandparents' houses in bookcases and also at home when I was a, a, a girl, a young girl, they were in our house at home. So I was directed perhaps to, I think, Perhaps Rob Roy uh, first, because it was a great story and Rob Roy McGregor was such a dashing character. But then all mortality uh, came across my radar because we used to holiday uh, where my mother was raised in the Clyde Valley. And I was told that my ancestors uh, were Covenanters. And I used to play at the disused Hall Bar Tower, which was very near our land. And I was always told that there was a secret passage from Hall Bar Tower to Tilly Toodlem Castle. I thought, what a name, Tilly Toodlem Castle anyway. And we always used to try and find this secret passage. So the story is really resonated with me. And um, just while I was, and the, the, these are, these are, these are, there's um, Red Gauntlet, which I absolutely uh, loved post 45. Obviously there's Rob Roy, and there's my copy of All Mortality, which I then went on to study in Scottish Literature at University. But what I did come across was Tales uh, of a Grandfather, which was Walter Scott's histories, particular incidents up to 1707. And my gr grandmother's writing is in here, and it was to my father on uh, when he was 11. And my father always had a great love of Scottish history, studied history before he did law. Um, but I loved this because I must have read this as a child. Look. The illustrations of these stories are fantastic. And he'd marked the ones that he really loved, which, you know, as an 11 year old, he'd marked um, William Wallace, he'd marked Robert the Bruce, then he'd marked um, about uh, Mary and the Regent Maury. I think that was what it was. Yes, the story of Sir Walter Scott, sorry, the story of Sir William Wallace, the rise of Robert the Bruce, he'd marked Murray, Murder of Maury and Mary's Captivity as particular ones. So when he was 11 years old, this was probably his introduction to Scottish history. And actually, I think for young people now, they would do worse than reading this. What I really love about Walter Scott, he went around collecting stories. He was very much in the tradition of the oral history. Um, and particularly things like, you know, all mortality, obviously uh, set in Lanarkshire, as I said, where uh, my family's ancestors were Covenanters. But then when you uh, look at Rob Roy, set outside Glasgow, up by Loch Catron, uh, Loch Lomond, where people go, they should read Rob Roy before they go. Red Gauntlet, set down in Dumfries and Galloway, where I was born and where I returned to often. And so these are stories that are within, they're in our blood and um, they're exciting and they're a great way into Scottish history. Scott's influence, of course, is global. To reflect a little upon that, Let's hear from Diana Gabaldon, and a hugely successful American writer, best known perhaps for the Outlander series. So when I wrote Outlander, I had two full-time jobs and three children under the age of six. I wasn't going anywhere. Uh, so I did Outlander entirely from library research. Um, but uh, then we sold it and they gave me a three book contract. And I said to my husband, well, I really must go and see the place. And so we left the kids with my parents for uh, three weeks or so. 
and flew to Scotland, rented a car in London, drove up one side of the country, back down the other, and collecting books and uh, flowers and things all the way down. The story that both Sir Walter and I were telling, which is, you know, in some ways the same story, is, uh, is um, largely a product of its setting. You know, the romanticism, the secrecy of the, of the landscape. You can actually, as people did in the 18th century, take to the heather, as they put it, meaning that if you walked off into a field of heather and you were being chased, all you had to do was lie down. <laughs> they would never see you. <laughs> but yes, it's, uh, the landscape is a definite part of the, um, of the entire Bissau scene, I suppose you'd call it. Your Outlander series, of course, is, is globally famous, but tell me how you drew your inspiration from Scotland's often turbulent past. If you look at the Scottish Highlands, of course, it's a warrior culture. It was, and to a certain extent, it still is. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, men were raised with certain expectations, you know, that you would, in fact, go and get killed if necessary, which is naturally going to put you in a certain frame of mind. <laughs> Either you're cheery about it or you're not. <laughs> and, uh, Sir Walter mostly was. Uh, though he had a very good, you know, um, he had a good hand with human beings. He understood people. Uh, you know, he was obviously someone who enjoyed watching people, listening to them talk, picking up the idiosyncrasies of their, um, of their speech and their habits. And, uh, you know, there's a reason why the book is called Rob Roy and not Frank Osbaldistone. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but it would make a good book title regardless. Uh, you know, so um, anyway, Rob Roy is plainly an extremely colorful, dramatic, and easy to understand character. In other words, you need not know anything about the plot of the book to realize that this is going to be an exciting story. You have this uh, fabulous, to some extent, uh, Highland warrior, uh, very colorful. Um, everybody has at least heard his name, which is uh, rather ironic, considering that the McGregors were, in fact, outlawed and deprived of their surname for you know, a number of, uh, of decades. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's no wonder that, uh, that the book, even though it has its own love story, and it's the story, essentially, of a man finding his way. It's a quest and the romance and so forth. But there is this very strong thread of, uh, of politics running through it. And um, Sir Walter was very good at politics. That is, uh, he gave you the broad outlines, but he focused it on the personal. This is how the political situation affected these people. We're not going to lecture about you know, the rights and wrongs of what was happening. It's, this is what happened to these people because of the setting in which we found them. This was one of the interesting things about Scotland is that all of the history is still right there on the surface. And you can easily go to one of the castles and see all of the implements and photographs and you know, pictures and so forth that were there in the 18th century. And since the castle itself has not changed that much, it's very, very easy to imagine yourself back into uh, the proper times that. People always say, what did you feel when you saw Scotland for the first time? It was very moving. Looking out over Scotland, I felt very much like home. I was thinking, I know this place. Sir Walter Scott mostly wrote historical novels to assess that element. Let's hear from Scotland's preeminent historian, Professor Sir Tom Devine. It's very difficult for people today to appreciate the extraordinary scale and impact of Scott's novels, particularly, but also his poetry, on uh, external audiences. One has to remember that, of course, in that time, in the 19th century in particular, there was no radio or television medium. So the book was incredibly important. And Scott's writings, especially those which drew attention to the history and traditions of Scotland, um, really created what to a, a significant extent is still the image of Scotland historically uh, for international audiences today. Some literary critics have said he actually entranced entranced the international or global readership, put his native land firmly on the, the world map in a way which had not occurred before by any writer and has not occurred since by any writer. The 18th and 19th centuries were a period of, of extraordinary change in Scotland. Where does Sir Walter Scott fit into that? Sir Walter Scott, although perhaps not read today in the 21st century as he was in the 19th century, left a deep mark on his native land. One has to remember that Scott's era, when he lived, was a period of extraordinary um, cataclysmic transformational change. 
the change from an older Scotland to a modern Scotland due to industrialisation, urbanisation and the agrarian revolution of the time. There was a fear among many intellectuals that this would have two effects. One, Scot Scotland and Scots people would lose connection with their past, which gave them their sense of Scottishness, their identity. And the other fear was there would be assimilation with England due to the spread of Anglicisation. Among other factors, Sir Walter Scott's writings ensured that did not happen. He introduced, by a kind of magical alchemy, he introduced his fellow Scots to the world, the old world of Scotland historically, both in terms of myth and story and history. And that reconnected them, that reconnected them with what had gone before and what was in the process of disappearing. I mean, he himself argued what makes Scotland Scotland is fast disappearing. So one of his tasks in life was to renew that older Scotland so that it would not be forgotten as modernity kicked in in the early 19th, uh, in the early 19th century. We will all have a, a favourite novel among Sir Walter's canon, Mine's the, the Heart of Midlothian. What's your favourite, Tom? My favourite uh, piece of work is Waverley because um, in my own writings, my key period of history is the 18th and early 19th centuries. And Waverley takes place in the mid 18th century, uh, just as the old society is dying and the new society, particularly in the Highlands, was emerging. And it's fascinating to me that modern historians writing in the 20th century, in the 21st century, have shown that that kind of thesis he advanced as long ago as 1814 has proven to be co completely correct in terms of modern understanding and modern research. The power of Scott's uh, writings is such that I hope this year will result a, in a renaissance. The number of events that will take place will push him up in terms of both national and international profile. And I think that will give a new impetus to interest not only in Scott's studies academically, but also in people uh, picking up one of the books and seeing what the riches, the literary riches contained in those volumes. Apart from the historical perspective, we are decidedly interested in Sir Walter Scott's place in literature. Now, to assess that and other elements, let's hear from Damien Barr, a highly successful writer who's about to present a forthcoming BBC Scotland documentary on Scott. I am delighted to be taking part in the 250th birthday celebrations for Sir Walter Scott, the writer with the biggest monument to them in the world, that one right there on Princess Street, just down the road from Waverley Station. Walter Scott is such a part of our national story and our national literature that he's almost faded into the background. Now, I remember my first trip to Edinburgh, we'd gone to the zoo uh, and then we went into the city centre during the day and I saw the Scott Monument, which I thought was some kind of rocket made of stones. And, um, and I didn't make the connection at first to the writer um and you know on subsequent trips you know i'd get off the train at waverley station and you know and it was only when i went to edinburgh as a student that i really began to understand uh how much scott is built into the bricks um of that city and how much his writing is built into the bricks of scottish literature so much so that he is almost invisible. Things which seem staid or old now, you know, like, you know, or old hat even, like, you know, the, the historical characters meeting real life, you know, real life people. That, that, that was innovative, hugely innovative and new. Um, and that would have been shocking at the time. And I think, you know, I remember when I learned that um, he'd published his novels anonymously and it was such a long time before you know, he, he claimed them and, you know, got back the copyright and all the rest of it. But, you know, just this idea that, you know, for, for him, he, he felt he, you know, he felt he had to publish it anonymously. Um, and this, you know, what that means for him as a writer and as a person, and, you know, would I ever publish something anonymously? What, what, what would I have to write or say that I wouldn't want to own or wouldn't feel able to put my name to because of the constraints of the world around me? Um, I, just, I, th I thought that was really interesting. I don't feel like there's anything like the level of discussion that there should be 
um, that there should be about him. You know, if you think about how famous he was in his life, how many books he sold in his life, um, and um, how in, in some ways as well, how, how he kind of invented the idea of the, the writer. I mean, he was his own personal brand in a way. Um, and I think that's really interesting. You know, I remember when I visited Abbotsford and I went and I looked at his desk and I thought, God, all the hours that he spent here, you know, um, all the, you know, I was thinking hundreds of thousands of words that he wrote, millions of words that he wrote. I was trying to quantify it. Um, you know, and the place is suffused with his spirit. Um, but that's not just because he's dead and he's been dead for a long time. It, it was like that in his lifetime. So I'm really interested as a writer and as a reader in recontextualizing him and finding out what role, if any, he has to play for us today. 2022 is Scotland's year of storytelling. Now, to place Sir Walter Scott's contribution in that broader context, let's hear from Scotland's Culture Secretary, Fiona Hislop. Hello, uh, I'm so pleased to be part of the 250th anniversary of the birth of Sir Walter Scott celebrations. I share everyone's disappointment in not having the physical celebrations planned, but I applaud Abbotsford Trust in their efforts and success in bringing this digital celebration to life, thereby ensuring that more people can join in this fantastic event. There can be no doubt that the 250th anniversary of Scott's birth deserves this celebratory event. I'm sure we can all agree uh, Scott was undoubtedly one of Scotland's most prominent authors who made a profound impact on the rich culture and heritage we still know today in Scotland. It is not only a literary legacy that Scott has left. His footprint can be seen on the streets of our capital and throughout Scotland. From the iconic Waverley Steps in the heart of Edinburgh, inspired by his Waverley novel, at the Scott Monument in Princess Street Gardens, completed in 1844 as the world's largest monument to a writer, and in Scott's beloved borders, Abbotsford House, which attracts 66,000 visitors a year. Scott's works paved the way for Scotland's standing in the world as a romantic nation with no shortage of culture its fabric. Closing quote from Sir Walter Scott on this 250th uh, anniversary. To all, to each, a fair good night and pleasing dreams and slumbers light. Now let's hear from Matthew Maxwell Scott, a direct descendant of Sir Walter. Growing up, I was always acutely aware of my relationship with Sir Walter. It was something, a source of enormous pride to all the family. On um, our regular vis visits to Scotland, um, we would always go, come to see Abbotsford. Uh, we're very much aware of his presence on the banknotes of the Scott Monument. And of course, at home in the library, we had a full collection of Scott. So very much aware of him, aware of his greatness. As a member of the family, tell us about your childhood memories of Abbotsford. We used to come back up uh, every summer and go visit relations. And every time we'd always go and visit Patricia and Jean at Abbotsford. I particularly loved it as a child because at the end of every visit, we were allowed to go to the gift shop and choose anything we wanted. Patricia and Jean Maxwell Scott were my father's first cousins and they were the last direct descendants of Scott to live in Abbotsford. They were terrific ladies um, and we all loved them very, very much. And the job they did stewarding Abbotsford over so many years is something that should be recognised forever. Um, they were indefatigable in their approach to it and the difference that they made to the house over the decades in charge was enormous. After uh, Jean Maxwell Scott died, the BBC declared there were no remaining descendants of Scott left. In fact, that's quite untrue. There were a great number of us. Um, so my grandfather was their father's younger brother. And there are in fact um, several dozen of us still alive in places far flung as Canada and Australia, as well as here in the UK. One of my very important duties as a father is to instill in my young sons uh, a love of Scott and of, of the man himself and of his works. So certainly we'll be up at Abbotsford for the big day during the summer, but certainly we're very, very proud. Um, we know it's an occasion that must be celebrated, that all Scotland and all the United Kingdom should be celebrating and all lovers of literary work around the world should be celebrating. He was a very great man. This is a great anniversary of his birth and I'm really looking forward to a fantastic celebration.
Kirsty, the big event of this presentation is the illumination, the light show at Smalem. Tell us a bit about that. One of the things we really wanted to do with this show, I mean, this is the anniversary of his birth, of his beginning after all, is show that Scott didn't spring up fully formed as this creative um, heavyweight. He was a product of his experiences and his childhood and youth, just as all of us are. And so we wanted to go back to the place where the, the formative years that shaped him, which happened at Smalem Tower in Sandy Nile Farm. And he would stay there periodically, particularly in ill health as he was mm -hmm. recovering from the ravages of polio. Mm -hmm. He'd stay there with his grandparents mm -hmm. um, and with his Aunt Jenny. And this was the place where Scott the Storyteller was born. This is where he fell in love with the landscape, where he heard the traditional stories, the folk customs. And really this lit a fire in his belly and it was a fire that he continued to stoke throughout his life. So we wanted to get to that, that kernel of, of inspiration and the, the original spark of Scott. So what you can hope to see on tonight's show is a real chance to meet the boy Scott, mm. to meet that, that young man brimming with possibility, just like anyone else. He was, you know, shaped by these forces and became um, something rather special. Kirsty, thanks very much indeed. Let's go straight to the show now. Let's cross over to, to Smalem, to a real Scott enthusiast and the voice of the Edinburgh tattoo, Alistair Hutton. Alistair. Thank you, Brian, and welcome to Smalem Tower. When he was 18 months old, Sir Walter Scott contracted polio and he was sent to the farm of Sandy Now, which nestles snugly just below this tower. That was to help cure him of polio. Sadly, that didn't work and he walked with a limp for the rest of his life. But what it did do was fill his head with the tales of his ancestors, who had been the night riders of old, raiding across the border every night in centuries gone by as one of the ferocious border reavers. And now sit back and relax and enjoy the show as the lights go on on Smalem Tower. It is here at Sandy now, in the residence of my paternal grandfather, that I have the first consciousness of existence. My own enthusiasm was chiefly awakened by the wonderful and the terrible, the typical taste of children. I had always perused the usual, or maybe ten times the usual number of fairy tales, eastern stories and romances. I cannot easily forget the rapture with which I sat up reading by the light of a fire. I wished I had the lamp of Aladdin or the tapestry of some other eastern magician to fly away upon. My head was on fire for chivalry. I had an early partiality for the tales of my country and uh, an intimate acquaintance with its wildest places. O oh, Caledonia stern and wild, meet nurse for a poetic child, land of brown heath and shaggy wood, land of the mountain and the flood. The love of solitude was a passion of my early youth. When in my teens, I used to fly from company to have visions and imagine airy castles of my own. Show me an old castle or a field of battle, and I was at home at once, and I filled it with its combatants in their proper costume. Then rise those crags, that mountain tower, which charmed my fancy's wakening hour. But I have remained a child even unto this day, and thus I decided to make my bread by storytelling, and honest bread it is. 
I will dig in the mines of my imagination to find diamonds. These are magic leaves we spread. And the border winds blew those leaves around the world in epic poems and majestic novels. And let the border winds blow us now back to Sir Walter's Conundrum Castle and Brian Taylor. Wasn't that wonderful? Now, I'm sure we've whetted your appetite for more, so have a look at the, the website, walterscott250.com, for inspiration on places to visit all across Scotland, talks, events, and much more, all with a story to tell of Scott. Catch up with A Gift of Tales, five traditional border chronicles recorded by Mary Kenny, our professional storyteller. I'm told they're suitable for readers from 7 to 107. So experience the website, listen to the tales. Why not have a go at reading Sir Walter himself? Trust me, you'll really enjoy it. From me, Brian Taylor, goodbye from Abbotsford.